This is the Mohead Y'all Show, showcasing the newest and oldest beer style. Heady conversations. Behind the scenes clips. And subscriber exclusives. Do you like craft beer? We, we do, do too. too. I'm Ann Million Blair. And I'm Deacon Brother Trent. Get ready to pour, pour heavy. heavy. Hit it. Welcome back to another episode of Mohead Y'all. You get to listen to me for a little while longer again Yay. as I continue going down the origin stories of the Mohead Y'all crew. Now I have with me Aunt Million Blair. Woo! What's up, y'all? It's been a long time. I shouldn't have left you without a nice beer to drink, too. But I'm back, y'all. Well, welcome back. And the first question I have for you, where did Aunt Million Blair come from? Well, if you look over to, I guess you're right. <laughs> it would be the good deacon. Uh, the good deacon and... uh Riley had aspirations of being pro wrestlers. And, of course, every tag team wrestler, wrestling crew, they need a manager. Me, being that kind of a guy, I became the what would have been the manager. And old Deacon says, Aunt Million Blair, that, that's your manager name. You that's got it all figured fantastic. out. fantastic. And I, uh, re- I liked it so much, I even registered the domain name. So did you really? I did because it's that good. That is fantastic. Where else have you put this out there at? Uh, from time to time in the beer world and different places, just to see how it all landed in different areas. That the first book that I wrote, uh, Smart Ads, is under Aunt Million Blair under that pen name. So I put it out there too. So was it Smart Ads or Smart Ass? Well, so me and old brains old came up with that idea. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so it, smart ads, smart ass. Yeah, let's go with it. <laughs> right on, right on. Well, as you know, we're here to talk about your origin story, mm-hmm. and I've had the pleasure of interviewing you and other podcasts before. Yes, you have. And some things that I learned about you. One is that you grew up, and I'm on probably get this wrong, but in Flint, Michigan. Correct. And that in that place in Flint, Michigan, for lack of better words, you were growing up streets and and kind of figuring out your own way in a rough area. That was later on. Uh, okay, that, that was later on. There was some it, encounters along the way, but it wasn't until I got into my teenage years to where I really started figuring out what kind of trouble I wanted. To get well, into. isn't that usually where it's at when you get in your teenage years and start to rebel that you wanted to start doing things on your own and f everybody else? Yep, pretty much. Well, for me, it was <laughs> more making charged. money. Yeah, I wasn't really trying to fuck people up. I was trying to get paid. And you started hustling like crazy. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, at one point in time, I remember you were talking about you were hustling videotapes and VHS tapes back in the day. Yep, for sure, man. Before that, though, kind of how I got into the beer game was I was hustling beer when I was 16. I I did not know about this. How were you hustling beer when you were 16? Well, let me tell you, Jason Carr. So in the in the neighborhood, in in Flint, Detroit, Saginaw, that area, in the neighborhoods, most of the stores, if not all of the stores, are owned by Middle Eastern folks, right? So they come over. I don't, I can't remember how all the taxes and all that kind of works, but you know, you can just kind of cycle your family through. You get a business going here. You know, you bring over brother or sister. They work for three months or so. Help them start something else. Help them start something else, right? And then they go back home to reset the clock on the period where you don't need to go through the green card and all that, and then they'll come back. So they'll have enough people back home to where they can just kind of cycle people around. Keep bringing people into the U.S., keep running that family business. You got to go back home. It's all right. 100%. They don't care about ID. They care if you have money. Ah. So check it out. So back in the day, there was a place that's called the Micah Tam. It was a nightclub. So the Micah Tam kept selling the underage, so they wound up getting their liquor license pulled. So they turned the Micah Tam from an adult nightclub to a teen club. But they still had the same vibe. And Jason, they had the light up floor and the disco balls, all that shit, right? So they opened it up, teen club. You know, they have uh, virgin daiquiris, virgin margaritas, all that bullshit. But I mean, ain't nobody trying to drink that. Right, right. So being, being observant of the market, People who have money with no access to alcohol makes for a very ripe market to exploit. 
I got the connects in the city to get whatever you want. And I got a car. And I got a job so I can front myself. So I go, Sal's was the place. So me and old Sal, we were real cool. I walk in, I'll be like, hey, what's up, Sal? You know what you got new? But mostly people back then, they're in one Bud, Bud Light, Mick. The uh, cheap stuff that you can make a good profit on. Well, back then, you could get a freaking case of, I think, uh, like Bud, Bud Light, I want to say for like eight, nine bucks back then. And then you go into this place, and it's all about supply and demand. You 100%. had all the supply, and there was lots of demand. 100%. So I would, I, I literally doubled the markup. I mean, I was getting cases of beer for 10 i was selling them for 20 25 all day and if you want the good shit like miklo whatever you know that's a 30 dollar bill man i sell out every friday or no thursday friday and saturday so i re-up my homeboys work the door so i'll be like hey anybody who looking send them to the back anybody try to fuck with me oh by the way i know these big motherfuckers by the door who's going to kick your ass before you even get two or three swings in and i can hold you off for at least that long so i had it Locked down. I was getting paid. And so that's what got me thinking about beer at that early age. I wasn't really trying to drink it. I was trying to get paid off of it. And was it really thinking about beer as more as thinking about where's the demand in the market that isn't getting served, and then how do I serve that? Right. Because you then carry that on to not only the videotape business that you did, which tell a little bit like in, in a couple sentences about what you did with the videotape business. Oh, the videotape business was, that's where it all started with the internet stuff. You know, so a homeboy had some videotapes, couldn't sell uh, the traditional way. The internet was just blowing up. And I was like, hey, I bet you I could sell these over the internet. Threw those video cassette tapes on the internet in 1997. Yeah, in 97. Next thing I know, I'm selling videotapes to people all over the freaking world, man. So that summer, I made about ten grand just selling freaking VHS tapes. It was craziest thing ever, and that's what got me into my online marketing business. And then from there, in the online marketing business, I remember you telling me that you didn't really know at that time exactly what talent you had, mm-hmm. and it was until someone came into your life that helped you realize that what the talent was there. Yeah. It was someone that it was like a college professor or something like that. Yeah, yeah, Martha Hamp, man. She's probably good. She's probably long gone because she was old back then. And that was in 90, no shit, that was uh, 96, actually. Yeah, that was 96. Uh, I was in creative writing class, you know, because I'm you know, kind of like the warrior poet, right? You know, I go out and I kick ass, and then I'm like, man, I'm tired of kicking ass. I need to, like, Get were my there, mind right. <laughs> were there any women that were involved in this poetry that got you started in that way of like, I want to write love poetry to nah, impress some girls? No, nah, not really, because back in the day, that's when hip hop was blowing up. So it was more poetry in that lane. Uh, yep. You see, again, interest or not, right? Like you're into it, but then you see that this is what's hot and i want to get into that game right on man so yeah i might have had a recording studio at some point in time <laughs> like even before then but always on the move right so writing poets so writing rhymes then became writing poetry for therapy you know to keep my mind right so doing that i'm good at creative writing my creative writing teacher she says hey you ever hear do you do you know what advertising is and i didn't know what advertising was. I mean, I knew, but I didn't know that it was what it was. He's like the commercials that you see on TV or the commercials that they play or the uh, the segments that they play in between songs on a radio station. I said, oh, those. He said, yes, those are advertisements. I said, oh, didn't know. You know, they say commercials, but I didn't know Were it was advertising. advertising. was then just like what you see in magazines or? I didn't, I had no comprehension of the word. I knew I saw pictures in the magazine. I know I saw... I know I saw um, uh, commercials on TV, but I didn't realize that there was an industry that was the advertising industry, and that was an actual thing. So I didn't realize that until she turned me on to that idea. And when I got turned on to that idea, she said, "You know, you could probably do well in that area because you have the t- you have the writing ability already." I was in computer science. You know, you're an IT guy, so I was in computer science back then. But fuck, man, I couldn't get through the math. Yeah. 
<laughs> That's why I'm so glad that later on the math was kind of taken out where came the into the game too early. Yeah, yeah. Well, before we jump on, one of the things just Mo Hedge all style that I see that you poured here is a, a new beer I haven't heard of. What, what do we got here? Oh man, uh, it's a we a V heavy. <laughs> So, uh, Deegan, you might could give me a little bit more uh, of some background on it, seeing though I don't have my spectacles on it, but I know at least it's a... <laughs> oh, yeah, you could tell me. I don't know. Oh, man. L-A-S is, um, <laughs> is a wee heavy, L-Age and oak barrels. Uh, this is their house, their house beer. Yes, I think it's like the oldest occupied... Brewed in copper since 1738. Yeah. Brewed in copper since 1738. So does that mean that someone was just holding this in their garage? <laughs> Any copper barrel since 1738? People Shire. Uh, <laughs> people Shire Scotland. People. Oh, people. 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 People Shire Scotland. <laughs> and there you have it. I'm a big fan of uh, Scotch Ales and Wee Heavies. Um, the darker and the boozier usually the better. So... So then, you said Scotch ale. So I'm thinking, help me out as a newbie, right? Scotch mm-hmm. meaning like the sippy drink, Scotch, right? More Scottish, like More Scotch Scottish. People. Okay, okay. Not yeah. like it's they took a barrel that was that had Scotch in it once before, and then like the bourbon that barrel type be, stuff. That would actually be interesting enough for me to try <laughs> if that was a thing. <laughs> but no, not not quite that. Not like that. No, okay, not okay. Like that. Well, let's give it a taste and see what this is like. <clears throat> cheers. Oh, cheers, man. 100%. Yeah, it's all that maltiness and scotch aliness, wee heaviness. It's actually pretty smooth. Mm-hmm. A little smoky. A little bit, yeah. I can't describe like I'm having a hard time describing what I'm tasting here compared to some of the other beers that I've had. Well, you're not a real big dark beer drinker. I, I used to be. Oh, okay. Back in the day, I used to drink nothing but dark beer. Oh no shit. I, I think it, yeah, a little malty. Mm-hmm. But that's all I used to drink. And then I, I switched to light beer just because of the fact, like I said on one of the previous podcasts, I was out by Madison Shores on the river drinking dark beer in the hot sun. And oh, then that yeah. And killed me from <laughs> drinking dark beer for a while. Yes, I, I remember that lighter story. Stuff. Yeah, I got a little, a little bit of bitterness on the back end. You know, its finish is pretty clean. Um, it's light for, I think it's a 7.4 percent. I was going to ask what the ABV was on it. Yeah. You know, so I mean about the, about, about a two hearted in ABV with, um, you know, some cop, what would say probably, man, I wouldn't miss it. Eh, almost like, man, kind of cop, like kind of amber, copper, red kind of. When I look down through the glass. Un, you know, unlike some of the other dark beers that I've seen, I can actually see through it. Yeah, for it to be as dark as it is, yeah. you hold it up to the light, and you can see you can see the head at the top, persistent, just kind of lingering there. Yeah, I'm a big fan. Um, I'll probably butcher the story, but there is uh, some guys in the homebrew club here in town, you know, and I remember them talking about, you know, yeah, so I'm gonna heat up some some stones and throw them in the thing, and I'm like, what? <laughs> what are you talking they about? Soup? No, so help me out with that a little bit too, Deacon. The Stones, Clankenstein, Clankenstein. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so they were doing that, and I was like, "Wow, for real, <laughs> for real, for real." OG Steagles, big, big rock Steagles. Yeah, and just that whole idea. You know, I'm always, um, I'm always a fan of, you know, kind of malty and piney, and you know, just those traditional style flavors. You know, I, I used to chase after the everythings. <laughs> the more you throw in it, the better. <laughs> like, you know, but now, you know, as I've gone through this beer adventure, I'm, I'm circling back to, you know, the more traditional styles, clean, crisp, light, 
you know, especially now that the weather's changing. Yeah. But it's I mean, getting it's getting a little bit hotter. And... Yeah, man. It's getting a little hotter. I mean, you have your story. You know how it is. Yeah, you yeah, drink yeah. some big boys at like 13 or 14 or even 12 for that matter, and, or even nine and a half. And you're like, fuck, man. I need a freaking, I need a liquid IV right about yeah, now. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> so is this something that you've had before? Not this particular uh, brand, but definitely uh, the, the, st- style. the style. Okay. Yeah, definitely okay. style. I've been very privileged as a Patreon member to be able to get here and, and on thank you for a your couple patience. of different podcasts and, and do mm-hmm. this origin story. Mm-hmm. And I miss my brother that I haven't necessarily been able to meet. Chad's the only person I've been able to meet from the Patreon, but we got oh, yeah. LB as well. And LB. I haven't had a chance to meet LB. Soon, man. Soon. And I understand <laughs> that there's a couple more that joined the family. We did. Riley and Dino. Shout out to y'all for pulling up on the Mohead Y'all show with the support. You know, we loved you beforehand, but we really love your asses now. <laughs> Round of applause. Yeah. <laughs> so so going back to your creative writing teacher and what she meant to you as kind of pushing you forward and opening up that door and what's amazing from when i first met you is how much then you have been that for other people me especially Mm, and how you've been the person to open up doors for other folks whether it's just a physical door of like hey let me introduce you to these people or just opening up that door in their head of like you can do this thing if you apply that you just have to give yourself permission to go access it 100% and I've noticed that you've done us also with with beer like I remember over at the local movie theater that yeah, yes. you did a beer fest, if you will, or Yeah, it was a beer fundraiser. And, and what tell us more about that. Oh my gosh, man. That was that was a defining moment, you know, for me and <laughs> from Mohead y'all, you know, it opened up some doors even in Columbus so far as people doing things. You know, Brains was, I mean, Brains was so fucking clutch in that whole thing. Now, I couldn't have pulled it off without her. I couldn't have pulled it off without her. And, you know, we were we were working together, you know, doing some things. And we were doing some stuff with uh, with the uh, early Mohead y'all show, like the, 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 the Genesis, you know, the OG, yeah, the OG version, you know, we were all doing Fort Franklin and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, Trent was getting involved with it at that point, but I had this idea. I said, man, you know, what if we were to, you know, do a beer fundraiser for Lincoln, Cent- Lincoln neighborhood, Lincoln central neighborhood family center. Oh, it, man. I always, Diane, if you're listening, y'all really got to do something with that name. Y'all got me fucked up with that every single time. Every single time. <laughs> At any rate, love them to death. Um, they've been a big supporter of me. Uh, they put a cardboard cut out of me when I when Mohead Y'all was craft picks. So Mohead Y'all started out as craft picks like in a day, in a day, in a day, in a day, back in the day. And when I was doing that and they caught wind of it, you know, I was, a, I was in that Lincoln Central uh, neighborhood at that time. I can't really tell you what the boundaries are, but at that time I was living within those boundaries. And they bought a cardboard cutout, put it in a movie theater. I had my picture taken with that. Yes, you did. <laughs> yes, you did. Man, that cha- That was a game changer because when motherfuckers would roll up into Yes Cinema to watch whatever movie, you know, here I am with Denzel Washington and Oprah and <laughs> James Dean and <laughs> people losing their minds, right? Uh, so that they they supported me early on, you know, in that way. Um, that Mohead Jaw video that uh, is on our uh, YouTube page, mm. that the intro, you know, where I'm throwing the beer around and talking about Mohead and all that. Uh, they put that up on the big screen, so that was on the big screen for a while, and that was that was so surreal. Just seeing like, wow, man, this screen is big as fuck, and there I am on that screen. That was pretty cool. So they supported me through all that. So I wanted to turn the favor, right? You know, how can how can I, you know, help support their mission? You know, to help residents in that area, which is the most impoverished or uh, most they they have the most needs in Bartholomew County is the Lincoln Central neighborhood. So how can I help them? 
So I said, man, what if we did a beer fundraiser? So at the time, uh, the Brewers Association, the National Brewers Association, they released a documentary. It's called For the Love of Craft. If you remember, you could use that documentary for whatever reason. So I reached out to them. I was like, hey, you know, I got this idea. Do this fundraiser. Can I use the documentary? It's like, fuck yeah. They was like, you know, anything you need to help promote it, whatever. So got the green light from the Brewers Association. Then I, re- then I was like, hey, heaven. I was like, so what if? And she's like, well, if we did it, we do boom, 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 boom. And so we were on the whiteboard. You know, you see my whiteboard. The brains comes out. Yeah, yeah. man. So brain, she, uh, she uh, was like, this is how we do it. We, we raised enough money to buy Christmas gifts for 800 kids in Lincoln Central neighborhood. And we came up with the whole thing in like 20, from, from idea to execution, 27 days. That is amazing. Bro, tell me about it. And then the impact. And then the impact. Yeah. All from, All from beer. B- beer and, and the beer community, the poor people who are out there. Shout out to all the poor people who, well, yeah, y'all would be able to hear this, but y'all need to get on Patreon, though, to hear, hear all of the other good stuff that we do. But, man, I tell you, it was – they showed up man they did they showed up i don't know we might have had about 700 folks following us on facebook at the time and a few handfuls of folks on instagram at the time but when we put the word out you know uh deacon show uh, pulled up a lot of our people i like our people people you know pulled up volunteered supported um it, it was it was a great time it was a great time it we sounds almost- like an amazing night we almost packed up their bigger the- – so they have two theaters at Yes. They have one that's a, a larger and a smaller one. We almost filled it up. We had 100 and – I want to say 128 or 134 people pulled up for that, you know, and was buying raffle tickets, buying swag. I mean, we was giving away beer. I mean, it was and, – and even the people, of some of our uh, – our brewer friends, you know, they was giving us beer for free, you know, for, so that we could have for the event. When Powerhouse was still around, they donated like a keg. I mean, it was, we had bells, you know, they they gave us some glassware, they gave us swag from all over the place, man. It was just such a collaborative effort. And for me, that's when I really saw the power of what beer and people in the beer community can do together. So, just restate it again because you said it just a few minutes ago. What was the impact of that event onto the community? Like I said, a lot of kids had a good Christmas that year. A lot of kids had a good Christmas, and it brought the community together. You know, it was something that had never been done in Columbus ever before. You know, so it was it was a lot of people who didn't know one another getting to know one another over good beer. It was it it the 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 ripples of it. You know, I think still carry today in some of the things that we're seeing now with what's going on with beer in the Columbus community. So let's rewind for a second. You had started off, you said, with your in, into beer, of uh, being the salesman and filling the demand and, and so forth. But at that time, you're whatever is the cheapest a year trying to get out there to, to make the profit, right? Mm-hmm. And then now we have this moment where you're having this beer fundraiser. Mm-hmm. Someplace before that, in between those two times, you became a Cicerone. Yeah, which that then too. even before that, there hadn't been a moment where it was just like beer means more to me than just something I'm selling or drinking. Mm-hmm. When was that moment? You want to know something? To be honest, it was when uh, me and Deacon and Brains started to get down at Fort Franklin, and you know I used to have a house that wasn't very far from Zwanzig, so uh, Deacon and Brains used to work at Zwan's Egg. So Brains, she would serve me. I'd just see Deacon, he'd be doing his thing in the pizza, and I'd see him in the alleyway. So I'd walk through the alleyway to get to my office downtown, which passed Zwan's Sounds kind of scary. Dude, the alleys in Columbus aren't scary, I promise you. <laughs> Comparatively speaking. I'm just picturing Deacon coming out of the alley. Oh, ha <laughs> <laughs> Man, that handsome guy, there's nothing to worry about with him. But when he takes his glasses off, though, then you're you're in deep shit. <laughs> it's like Cyclops from the X-Men. I'm trying to tell you. But, uh, you know, we, we just got together, and we had so much in common, and it really started out over beer. I probably wouldn't have met Deacon if we didn't have shared interest in beer. I probably wouldn't have met Heaven if we didn't have shared interest in beer. So when I got with them, 
and we did that fundraiser. It was the community, you know, it was, it, that's that's what really resonated with me. Yeah, the beer's fine, but man, I've met a lot of cool people. A lot of cool people drinking beer, traveling for beer, going to beer share, standing in beer lines. You know, that's when I started to, like I said, just really understand the true impact that beer can have, you know, how it brings people together, you know, how it unites people for the most part. Now, there are some assholes who drink cheaper beer. (laughs) Well, and that's where, again, my brain still has this disconnect of, where the things that you just described I've had with with my friends just hanging around the pool drinking beer and not really thinking about what we're drinking. Mm-hmm. Do you feel me? It's just yep. like, hey, we're just drinking alcohol. Yeah, we just got some here to uh, right. lubricate us. Yep, exactly. And that's that's the thing, but I feel that what you're describing is not that thing, it's something else. Can you help me connect those dots a little bit? So you're talking about you hanging out with your homeboys. We're hanging out. We're just drinking beer just to drink beer. But it almost sounds like what you're describing is that's a component of it. But then there's this other thing about, I don't know if it's about like my nerd head goes into collecting stuff or understanding, maybe it's understanding the science behind beer making and we nerd out about that. Or it's just... You know, like we just talked about describing this beer, it's malty, it, you can see through the glass, you know, the darkness of it, you know, how does it go from, for you, from being just, I'm drinking things over here to now it's something a little bit different. You said that beer brought you and Trent in heaven together. Mm-hmm. How so? Beyond just sitting there drinking alcohol, it sounds like to me it was something more, it was bigger than just drinking alcohol. Oh, yeah, it was bigger. Yeah, 100 percent, man. It's again, it's the unity that comes from it. Right. So I can go most most breweries that I go to if I'm traveling, I'm usually the only or one of the few highly melanated folks in the crowd. I can roll up in there, not know, not nary a motherfucker and be like, sit at the bar and just start conversating with somebody I ain't never met before. Extrovertedness. Well, and there, yeah, that's a part of it too, but there's also, again, it's just that shared interest in beer. I mean, you can always start a conversation and be like, hey, what are you drinking? Mm. And then that person's going to be like, oh, I'm drinking so-and-so. Hey, are you a regular here? How often do you come? What's your favorite styles? And then the next thing you know, that common thread of beer, you've made a new friend. You know, I'll I'll give you a perfect example. Uh, So I was in Flint, uh, Last week, there's an alley bar. Going back to the alley, <laughs> there's an alley bar. It's called the Torch. A lot of alleys. Dude, I am an alley cat, one hundred percent. So there's an alley bar in Flint. It's called the Torch. Dive ass freaking. It it, it kind of reminds me of the Brick, only it's in the. It's only it's downtown. I mean. The motherfucker who's cooking the burgers and the fries, they have like two two fryers and a, maybe a, a, a grill that's about as big as this half of the table. And it's one of those steel grills. Yeah, it's that, one of those right, steel like you grills. You would almost see like in a diner. 100%. Like a Waffle House or something like that. 100%, but it's at the end of the bar. Oh. It's, it's, it's fantastic, man. It's fantastic. Well, it turns out they were having a bottle share at the Torch. So the owner is a beer head. Didn't know. But they were having a beer share up top. I'm down there, and, you know, they had um, they had a Three Floyds beer, that Coco Cocomunga. They had that uh, fleet, Three Floyds beer, Cocomunga, and I was like, oh, you know, I'm from Indiana, blah, blah, blah. So then the bartender, we have a conversation. Well, what brings you here? Oh, yeah, you know, my people are here in Flint. Oh, that's cool, man. I used to work at Bubba's. No shit, Bubba's was the shit. Oh, my God, what you used to do there? So that whole experience, again, it's just it's the beer – help to create the common thread that could then be used to create a relationship. Turns out I get introduced to the owner. He's a beer guy. He gives me his phone number. He gives me his email. Next time you're in town, let me know. We can trade beers. We can drink beers. I'll even put together a bottle share. So, I mean, that's, that's, that's the magic, man. You know, people who are in this community for the most part, 
they're sure they're you know Hayes boys and people who are chasing whales and all the bullshit. But I think the majority of people who are in the beer community, the crab beer community, anyway, it's it's the common thread. It's the unifying effect of beer bringing people together. There are so many different types of people that drink beer that get into an understanding the different types of beer or wanting to talk about it. it as you were describing that i think about all the comic cons that i go to mm. and, and my nerd brain and, and when i go to these comic cons we're all one community that exactly we we're all into the same stuff however we're all generally introverted mm. And so then starting to have those conversations about like nerding out about Harry Potter or nerding out about Kevin Smith or, you know, whatever, where there's initially that hesitancy, if you will, which I would think, and I'm making an assumption here, that beer helps get past that initial hesitancy as well. Ah, yeah, good point. Absolutely, it does. It's the social lubricant. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of social lubricant, <laughs> so just talk real quick while I run over here and grab another beer. <laughs> oh, or well, yeah, they can go ahead. Grab that uh, cu- cuvee bouvet. <laughs> uh, we learned a long time ago, or at least on the last podcast that I was in, we had to be very careful about using the word cuvee and what that means because the way that he talked about uh, a certain Thanks, beer sir. being cuveed and coffee pots and all that other stuff. Okay. Do you not recall what I'm talking about? I, you know what, man, I might have drank several beers since the last time that happened. <laughs> I just encourage you, listeners, to go back and and check out that previous co- podcast and the things that uh, Brother Dickie was talking about cuvain together. It was quite interesting, and I felt very much like I could not share that podcast with uh, some of my people at work. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow this is coming out into more of like a juice looking well they like a grape juice so the idea so the idea behind this is cherry it's a sour ale with cherry and blueberry cherry and blueberry cherry and blueberry i bought this and it looks like it's back. in like a a metal bottle one thing i like about sun king is they put they they use these aluminum bottles. So I like the idea of a bottle, but you know, glass is glass. Yeah, yeah. Well the other thing it was funny when I when you brought that out, I was just coming back from California and in the airport they had water that was in bottles just like that. Oh, nice. And you're selling them for like six dollars a bottle. I heard a rumor that that this is going to probably be the dominant mm-hmm, the dominant format. I mean, it makes a lot of sense. For moving forward with a lot of... It's going to uh, be less expensive. 100%. But I thought, you know, I was like, man, I don't understand why. Because I know aluminum prices went up during the pandemic. Glass is so expensive. Well, and now I was just going to say, so now it's like, oh, well, but probably glass went up too. So, yeah, it's probably... <laughs> it's probably... Even, even though this is more expensive now, it's probably still less expensive than glass. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. walk me through this a little bit here about, have you had this before? I have not. Okay, so all new for you. Ooh. <laughs> oh, it just smells sour. And that's exactly what I'm saying. It smells like it's going to be tardy. <laughs> tardy. <laughs> <laughs> I love your descriptors, Jay. <laughs> Oh my God! You oh, weren't wrong. Oh yeah. Mm. Woo! Woo! My cheeks. I don't know if that's going <laughs> to take hair off my chest or put hair on my chest. Oh Woo. gosh! My cheeks. <laughs> Not my butt cheeks. <laughs> my cheek oh cheeks. Oh my gosh! <laughs> Woo! Yeah, I've not been much into. S- I've not tried many sour beers. I shouldn't say I haven't been into sour beers. I've not tried. The only one I've tried is Petrus. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's a good one. Um, I, I can tell you that. Um, thank you for bringing this. Mm. 
uh, yeah, this is not my lane. Yeah, I know that's not your lane. I know <laughs> that that's not this isn't what you do. I'll gladly take that off your hands if you're not going to finish it. But you should you should you should man it up and just go ahead and drink it. Oh, now we're going to bring that. Okay. No, no, right this on. man. Yeah. No, no beer uh, left behind, yeah, man. Okay. No beer right left on. behind. No, no beer left behind. Oh, it's like every drink is just. <laughs> It's like <laughs> when I was in middle school and tearjerkers were the thing and everybody was, you put one of those in your mouth and you're just like, oh, I'm dying, I'm dying. Oh. <laughs> well, then I'll, I'll, I'll save the other sour beer for, <laughs> for, when, <laughs> for when we get together and we do uh, our uh, re- regularly scheduled programming. <laughs> <laughs> Be right back. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank uh-huh. you for sharing how, from an origin perspective, of how beer has helped you grow in a sense, right? Like, yeah, you, definitely. It, it played one part in your life at a certain time, and then because of uh, of what beer means to a community in general, right? Mm-hmm. Whether it's just that you said that social lubricant to bring people together, you were doing that back in the teen club. And then moving it, you know, forward. Once you had that person kind of intersect in your life and redirect on what the art of the possible really was mm-hmm. for you, and and that's one of the things that's always kind of fascinated me about about you is you're always looking towards what is the art of the possible, whether it's mm. with mohead y'all, whether it's with doing a beer fundraiser or or other things what i guess captures your imagination about the art of the possible the possibilities man you know what i mean i mean coming from a place where you know people just don't not not making a blanket statement it's hard for people to see what's possible you know, when you're growing up and you know your parents are strung out on fucking whatever or, you know, some motherfucker got shot the other night because <laughs> pick a reason. Right. You know what I'm saying? Um, the fact that there are possibilities and saying and helping people see, you know, may, maybe they maybe they don't see any possibilities. I see I see thousands of possibilities. Right. But can I instill the. The, the can I inspire someone to at least see one new possibility outside of what their everyday is? And, and that's so important because we get caught up in the whirlwind every day. One hundred percent. We have to we have to make money, we have to feed ourselves, we have to have to this, have to that, have to, have to, have to. And I find it's rare that we step back and just for lack of better words, think instead of constantly being that muscle or that just reacting and, and, and trying to move forward and doing the things that you're supposed to do every single day to step back, to step back and think about what could be different in, into the future. And, and again, not trying to blow smoke up your, up your butt or anything like that. I think that's one of the things that you're very talented at is saying, sitting back and thinking not just for yourself but for other people mm-hmm. and having helping them see what is the possibility and That's right. and you've done such a great job in that and that's turned into another fruitful business for you indeed <laughs> indeed all from you know started speaking doing speaking doing speaker coaching doing executive coaching all of that man um i i don't know if you even know this so even when i was in toastmasters i think maybe even before you got there i did a mo head y'all talk for an ignite speaking competition Mm. here in columbus right so you know even even that you know even even within that being able to share that with people and people say wow i didn't know that that was possible that you could have such a rich deep experience with a beer you know i'm telling people hey you know just don't drink it you know you know swish it around your mouth less it on your tongue breathe out through your nose there's a whole bunch of different things you can do with it and they're like oh wow 
I didn't know that was possible. You know what I mean? And they were, you know, earlier on and even just recently, you know, there's people who will watch uh, Deacon's beer reviews and they'll be like, wow, I didn't know that beer even existed. I think I'll go try it. I didn't even know it was possible that you could make a blue beer. I didn't even know it was possible that you could make a, a 9% hazy seltzer or what the fuck ever. You know what I, I mean? <laughs> until I started listening, I purely started listening to the podcast because of you. I appreciate to support that. To support you, I didn't know Trent or Heaven at the time, mm-hmm. and the more that I've listened, the more I'm like, oh wow, you can potentially make a beer that glows in the dark. Yeah, like yeah, and I've that's been, possible. I, I've been telling everybody about that, and they're like, that can't be good for you. And I'm like, well, this guy's going to make it naturally, so it, it, the, the art of the possible is out there, and it takes us a few moments to step back and and just think and realize that it, it is there or having a really awesome person help you realize it. So right, friends, open yourself up to the art of the possible, open yourself up to other people. And maybe it is through that social lubricant of, of beer yeah. and, and joining us there. Uh, you know, if you want to hear more about what is the art of the possible, Stick around and, and become a Patreon member and listen to the Palette Cleanser. Palette Cleanser. But, Ant, thank you again for giving me the opportunity to sit down with you today and, and hear more about your origin story and get to know everyone here at Mohead, y'all, just a little bit more intimately. Yeah, appreciate it, Jason. You are, we're going to get you that radio show pretty quick. <laughs> you're, you're, you're a great interviewer. You are a good friend. You're a great supporter. And thank you for showing up and pulling up and drinking this sour beer that's making your cheeks uh, cave in. Cry a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for hanging out, y'all. Yo, don't forget to check us out on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, and Patreon. Patreon. Remember to enjoy responsibly. Take care of each other. And always pour, pour heavy. heavy.